Welcome back to our second session today, and we have our second keynote, uh, which I think, I, I imagine is going to be quite fascinating. Um, when I was thinking of who to invite for keynotes, I thought for me, Alexandra Supple was an obvious choice, but also, given the theme of the conference, sonification for everyday life, and we've had keynotes that did very typical reviews of sonification, history, and that kind of thing. And I really wanted to invite people who would maybe give us a wider perspective on our practice as a community. And Jude just jumped out as someone who would be able to do that for us, no pressure. <laughs> and, and Jude is a senior lecturer at the University of York. And when you look at her publication profile, I think you'll understand what I'm talking about. Um, Sonicules, Designing Drugs with Sound, Approaches to Sound Design for Film, Audiovisual Performance and Interactive Sonification. I'd love to know how that all glues together. Um, the impact of gender on conference authorship in audio engineering. Perception of low frequency content of amplified music in arenas. Acoustic heritage. Music perception and performance in virtual acoustic spaces. An algorithmic approach to the manipulation of B format impulse responses, and so on and so on. And I know Jude also does an awful lot in terms of widening participation, so it is my very great pleasure to introduce Jude Brereton to you for what I'm sure is going to be a tour de force. So thank you, Jude. Thank you very much, Paul, for that amazing introduction. Um, I've just remade my PowerPoint slides because PowerPoint doesn't like me and it dropped all the sound. And you know, it's a sound conference, so I thought I'd better have some sounds in there. <laughs> So do forgive me if at certain points during the presentation I have to faff around a little bit um, in order to play some videos. Um, it's a really great honour and a pleasure to be here with you today. As Paul mentioned, I'm a little bit like Olaf who popped up in Batley uh, one day. I pop up in all sorts of different places um, and I think as I talk to you today you'll realise why. Um, my quite varied background um, academically and in terms of disciplines that I've been involved with over the years. Um, when Paul asked me to talk, he asked me if I could see if I could relate some aspects of my talk to ICAD's 25th um, birthday this year. I think that's correct. 25th conference. So we're sort of celebrating or commemorating sort of 25 years um, as, as of ICAD as a community that come together to discuss all various aspects of sonification and everything around it. And it struck me, I had a, a birthday recently, and it struck me that 25 years is about the length of time that I've been a proper adult. Um, it's about the length of time since I first graduated from my very first degree. So I have a degree in linguistics, German in linguistics, I have a degree in speech and language processing, and I have a degree in music technology. I've trained as a classical musician, and I still perform as a musician, although not for money anymore, um, just, just as an amateur. As Paul mentioned, I'm interested in widening participation um, in higher education, but also in music technology quite specifically. Um, anybody who's ever been to a music technology-based conference will realize you look around and there are not too many female faces. So that's one of my great uh, passions to try and encourage more girls and more women um, into music technology and audio engineering. And my current role as admissions tutor means that I work with youngsters and young people um, thinking of coming to our courses to study with us in the Department of Electronic Engineering at the University of York, which is where we teach music technology very much grounded in an electronic engineering degree. So maybe a little bit like ICAD over the last 25 years, I feel like I've been um, straddling the arts-science divide, and we've had a few people this morning already speak a little bit about that. But today what I want to do is to really throw in some personal reflections, um, informed by some of my work around listener and performance perception of acoustics, and also then allow us to see and hear a little bit more of two or three of the larger scale um, public engagement projects that I've been involved with over the last six or seven years. 
There'll be some big themes that I mention. I, I won't flag them up. They won't flash at you on the screen. But I, I, I hope you'll, you'll be able to follow a little bit of a thread. And, and when I summarise at the end, I'll try and pull some of those big themes together. Um, because I know they are themes that will resonate strongly with everyone here at the conference. I've been following you on Twitter, even though I've not been able to be here in, purpose, in person. Um, and I think they're big themes that you've been talking and discussing around. Okay, so first I want to go not back to 25 years ago, 1994, which is when I was just about to graduate, but back even further in time. Say a little bit more about me and my background. So when I was about eight or nine years old, my favorite Christmas present was pictured on the left here, a <laughs> stylophone. Okay, it was beautiful. It was a simple but effective musical instrument. It was my first taste of an analog synthesizer. Um, and later in the 1980s, I spent many an hour, probably my parents um, wanted to kill me, trying to emulate some of those iconic 1980s synth solos. Okay. <laughs> I have to say, I've got a little bit of a croaky voice today, and that's because two weeks ago, I was belting my voice out singing 1980s pop music. So I apologize for that, and I, I'm hoping I can get through the next 45 minutes. Okay, so catch your mind back to the 1980s for those of us who were around. And one day I come home to find the stylophone has gone missing, just disappeared. Look for it everywhere and I can't find it. And I realise that my father and my brother have stolen it. They've stolen it and they've repurposed it. I know, Thomas, I know. It's just, <laughs> we're still talking, it's fine. Right. Um, they've stolen the stylophone and they've taken it upstairs to the attic and they've repurposed it as a model railway signal control. <laughs> okay, so I was really not very impressed by this, um, and it put me off engineering. I was going to say for life, but obviously I now teach in the electronic engineering department. Okay, but for me at home, you know, music was what happened downstairs in the dining room, and uh, engineering was what happened upstairs in the attic, and it was very much along gendered lines as well. So my brother actually studied at university in Newcastle. He studied electronic engineering, and I went on to study music and linguistics. If I'd known then what I know now, then I would have embraced the challenge of turning the stylophone, a stylophone synthesizer come railway signal control <laughs> into some sort of multimodal musical instrument that combined that analog synth sound with maybe the visual and perhaps even the sonic representations of little trains going around tracks in different directions at different speeds, but I didn't know that then. <laughs> okay, so we get, we get a theme coming through, this sort of divide between um, art and engineering or music and science. Still in the 1980s, I'm afraid. It was a formative time for many people. Um, this is one of my favorite games to play. And when I play, um, some sound, you might know why. <laughs> so I think actually that was one of my first experiences of using sound to understand data. So this is Chucky Egg. Um, there are 11 levels, I don't know anybody got to level 11, um, but I used, no, you didn't, I, so, so I used to get to level 3 without actually looking at the screen, um, because I'd memorised the sounds that the movement of the chicken, I think you can see the chicken sort of to the middle and the left of the screen, and, and you have to um, move the chicken around, try and avoid the big blue ducks, or are they ostrich? Not quite sure. Pick up the eggs, and, and even if just um, listening to that, the sound of that game, it's a very simple sort of sonification, isn't it? It's a very simple um, data mapping, very simple parameter mapping, the, the ear comes in effect. So there are different sounds for um, picking up an egg, for bumping into a duck, for going up a ladder. Pitch is uh, mapped to the height of the ladder or the height that you're jumping. So that allowed me, as a youngster, to play this without even looking at a screen. Um, even though I live in a household where maths and music and engineering and art were equally valued, age 16, and I think this happens to many 
youngsters in this country at least, maybe not so much in other European countries or other countries around the world, had to make a choice. I had to make a choice at age 16. I had to choose whether I wanted to continue studying maths or music. I wasn't allowed to do both. There was no room in my school curriculum to do both. In fact, one of my teachers said to me, why on earth would you want to study maths and music? There's obviously no connection between those two <laughs> subjects. <laughs> and it was a really difficult choice, especially since my father was the head of the maths department at the school at the time. Um, but I, I did actually plump for music. So, okay, I've got to make this choice. I'll go for music. And at the time, I really understood, and it was really obvious to me, that music gave me a means to communicate. It gave me a means to connect with other people, not just the other people I performed music with, but also with audiences that came to listen to that music. And I didn't want to lose that. I wanted to retain that ability to establish an emotional connection and emotional engagement with audiences. And for me, maths and engineering group didn't seem to hold that possibility at that age. So I think, I think for many, much of my life I've been sort of trying to choose between science and art. Uh, and maybe now, after 25 or more years, I've managed to meld them together um, a little bit more. So I went to university, I studied music for a while, and then I, I, I switched to, over to linguistics and speech and, and German. And that's when I really became interested in acoustic phonetics, um, the acoustics of speech. Obviously combining my musical studies and my interest in language. And it struck me that really we have a very deep connection with the sound of the voice. And in fact, before we're even born, we're listening to vocal sounds in the womb. So even once we arrive in the world, we've had um, nine months or so of listening and, and beginning to understand what vocal sounds mean. So I was interested in acoustic phonetics, and I was interested in how um, people make sense of language, not just in terms of the words that are spoken and the meanings of the words, so semantics in effect, but also in what you might call the paralinguistic features um, that people can recognize when anybody is speaking. So anytime we speak or we listen to somebody speaking, we're in effect um, listening to a sonification of data, if that's not too far-fetched. So it's data that we could capture by, uh, and some of my colleagues do this, by uh, an MRI scan uh, of the vocal tract area. It's data that we could measure, we could calculate, we could measure the, um, the, the, uh, the physical, physical aspects of the vocal tract, we could uh, Imagine that vocal tract is, is a sort of rather small, squishy, and slightly moist room, and we can uh, model the uh, acoustics of the vocal tract and, 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 and try and estimate uh, what vocal sounds and how they are being produced. But it means so much more than that. So if we imagine that every time we speak, we're sonifying data, the data about our own vocal tracts, it's more than that. We're also sonifying data, and if we know how to recognize it, about where people come from, where you've grown up, um, how you're feeling at the time, your emotional state, um, who I'm trying to be. Um, <laughs> if I've got a cold, if I've ruined my voice singing aha hits last <laughs> two weeks ago, if we've all been out too late last night and drunk too much alcohol and eaten too much heat and mess, all of that is reflected in the voice. And that was absolutely fascinating to me, that in effect, every time we speak and every time we listen to somebody, there's a rich, you know, we talk about big data, but this is a hugely rich data set, set that's flashing past us, uh, past our ears uh, at speed. But as human beings, because we've, we have some innate ability to understand, we intuitively, intuitively understand the voice, even if we don't understand the words that have been spoken. So that's another big theme, I think, um, that I, th I think you've also been talking about in this conference, is that our intuitive understanding of sound as human beings and how we can exploit that and build on that. I went on after, after studying to, to then uh, work in the arts industry 
uh, for a while and I got really involved in public events and theatre shows and generally getting things organised and getting them on stage and getting audiences involved. So I'm not going to talk, talk too much about that. I came back into academia as a research assistant and started working on a number of projects, all of which connected music and technology. So this is where I really found, you know, I, I got the dining room and the attic back together again. Um, and this picture here is uh, a, a, a good friend of mine tweeted it recently. Um, she runs a, a, her own singing studio. She's a singing trainer. And she's been working with singers recently. And this is what we were doing um, in, in 2003, 2004, 2005, is working with singers and using technology as a tool to help them understand um, and to, and to um, go along with listening to the sounds they were making, but also to be able to have a visual representation of the sounds that they were making whilst they were trying to sing. So here this, this, this singer's just the, 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 the look of surprise when she suddenly sees her own voice on the screen and understands what has happened in the spectrum, in the spectrographic display that um, she has there when she's applied one of the resonance strategies that she's been learning. So a project worked on called Nepotech, it really connected singers and singing teachers with music technologists, with audio engineers. Um, and it wasn't particularly um, state-of-the-art technology we were working, but it did allow a singer to visualise some of the aspects of the singing training that they've been working on. It was a very simple idea and there was a very simple outcome. Um, some of the words on the right-hand side in the word cloud that I've made there, these are singing teachers and audio engineers, music technologists, we're all talking about sound, but we talk about sound in very different ways. So a very big part of the project was about connecting those two sets of people, um, musicians, singers, singing trainers, um, and, and audio engineers, and people working at technology, and trying to establish a sort of shared vocabulary. So when, some, when a singing teacher says, oh, you know, imagine a string coming out of the top of your head and that's going to um, project, uh, What's actually happening if somebody is going to imagine a string coming out of the top of their head? What's that doing for them? Um, does it change the physiology? Does it change their uh, posture? Yes, it does. And what does that do to the sound? That's really what we were trying to establish. Some people might say that that sort of project is really um, somewhat reductionist, you know, trying to break things down into their constituent, ever increasingly small parts. Um, and why would you want to do that? This is music, this is, you know, this is singing, this is this, this beautiful art that, that we uh, are trying to produce. But actually for me, I, I feel that whenever we do start to break things down into smaller parts to try and really understand, that's often the point for me where the, the enormity, that, I mean, the, the value and the, um, the experience of the whole, it's reinforced that it's so much more than the sum of the constituent parts. As I said, I've been interested in working with singers, and singers often perform in spaces. Um, they get to perform in some of the nicest spaces, um, especially if you're a classical music singer. Especially in York, where we have the beautiful um, and acoustically interesting York Minster. However, because I wanted to, to find out more about the singing voice, we often had to um, record singers in the Anna Kirk chamber um, to get a real handle on what it was that they were doing. This is a quote from Will um, Kimball, who's a trombonist, an American trombonist, and he was involved in a project that that uh, led him to play in the anechoic chamber. He had to play the trombone. And he says, when there's nothing for the sound to bounce off, it's challenging to hear what you're doing. The tendency is to play louder and louder in order to hear yourself and try to create some kind of resonance. So dynamic shadings are difficult because of the lack of oral feedback, and you end up going as much by the feel of your embouchure as the sound. 
And I found this very much for singers that I was asking to sing in the anechoic chamber. James, I think you escaped that one, didn't you? Yeah. Maybe you weren't in York at the time, well done. <laughs> but I have a small group of singers in York and they remember me as, oh, you're the person that tortured us and made us sing in the anechoic chamber. Because the first thing that happens is you go in there, you sing, and you can't hear yourself anymore. So then you force the voice, um, and then what you're getting is not a recording of somebody singing, but some, somebody singing, uh, forcing their voice while singing. So, not only are we as human beings instinctively and intuitively understanding sounds that other people make, I think as human beings, and especially as trained singers, we're instinctively and intuitively responding to the acoustic environment in which we are making sound. Okay, and we very much see this when we work with singers. Um, so I'm hoping I can play this and operate at the same time. So just to give you a flavour of uh, what I wanted to, to find out more about singing in different spaces, what you'll hear is um, a, a phrase, the first two phrases I think are recorded in the anechoic chamber, and then I'll take you to a different space and the visuals will change as well. And I hope listening to the sound you'll be able to get a sense of not only the change in the reverberation that you'll hear in the recording, but also a change in the voice quality of what the singer is actually doing at the time that they're in the different environments. So in the anechoic chamber, I flagged it up quite heavily, the singers tend to push their voice, it's a strained sound and then somewhere else. Well, I'll be interested to, to, to see by your reactions what, what you feel when you hear. Okay, so here we go. spaces is that a lot of the time they're subconsciously or unconsciously making um, small or sometimes large adjust adjustments to their singing to react to the space sometimes it's it's they're doing something and they can talk about it they say oh well you know if I have to sing in York Minster or or this space here this is the chapter house of York Minster then that's a big acoustic so I will sing more slowly um, they're not the interesting adjustments to the singing voice that people make when they adjust to their acoustic environments the more interesting ones are the ones that singers don't know that they're making because that to me means that there is more of this intuitive feedback loop that's going on. So um, a lot of my work then was to record acoustics of the, the, the acoustic fingerprint or the impulse response of different spaces uh, and then to ask singers to perform in there. So we collect a lot of data again, you know, so if we're thinking about data, um, we'll, we'll record an impulse response and that gives us um, lots and lots and lots of numbers which we can graph and we can look at it in the temporal domain as an impulse response That's an idealized plot. We can swap it over to the frequency domain and we can maybe say something about the acoustics of the room, whether there's a flutter echo, whether it's modal at low frequencies or, or more diffuse. Um, but if you take people who aren't acoustic engineers into spaces, they have a much more um, intuitive reaction. It's like, oh, this room's horrible <laughs> for singing in. Um, oh, this room's lovely, isn't it? Uh, it, it you know, it's, it just it seems to be a much more uh, a, a sort of gut reaction, as it were. So as acoustic engineers, when we're talking and we're, we're um, investigating different room acoustics, and we're doing that um, looking at lots of data sets, and we can, we can use the impulse response that we capture, the recording of that, to calculate many different room acoustic param parameters and it, it, it seems that almost every other 
uh, year somebody invents a new room acoustic parameter that will capture um, some sense of what this room is like for performing music or for speech. Okay, so there are many of them. I don't want to go into too many of them. But actually, it's when we, when we listen that we better understand what this means in terms of room acoustics. So I'm sort of trying to say room acoustics, oralization is, a, is, is like sonification of data. Okay, so hopefully these will work. Here is a bassoon. Okay. And that was recorded in the Anco chamber. It was a bassoonist I tortured um, in the Anco chamber. Uh, here's an impulse response of a space. Did you hear that? Yeah. Shall I play it again? Shall we play Guess the Space? <laughs> <laughs> it's quite low level, so you probably can't hear the me, but tail very well. It's York Minster. <laughs> James, James, you wanted to say, didn't you? Yes, so there's no prize. It's got a very long decay. It has a very it's long decay. It's a very distinctive. Sorry, because I'm not going to steal any of your time. No, because fine. I work in there every day, yeah. I'm really used to hearing that particular kind of decay. Yeah. Yeah. So, weird, so if, weird, but, so if you're an acoustic engineer and you spend a lot of time listening to impulse responses, you get to become a bit of an impulse response connoisseur. Uh, but actually, it makes much more sense if we now put that uh, bassoon in the York Minster. <laughs> students to York Minster. They were just in the Anacote Chamber, but we've done that through organisation. Okay. So I've done quite a bit of work um, looking at how singers respond to spaces. Now, I didn't get the funding to take um, five or six singers to lots of nice concert hall venues across Europe and, uh, and other places in the world, unfortunately. So we built what we call a virtual singing studio in the lab. In the first iteration, it was um, a um, octagonal array of just eight loudspeakers. Um, now we have um, a spherical array of 50 loudspeakers that we call the Thunderdome. Okay. Um, but, but I really wanted to be able to recreate in the lab, under lab conditions, different acoustic environments, um, record singers in there, and, and then really investigate what they are doing when they sing. So obvious things I mentioned earlier, you might sing more slowly if you're in a reverberant acoustic, but I also wanted to look at things like vibrato, at tuning, at timing, and at the timbral qualities of the voice. Because although as acoustic engineers, and we do this a lot now, we can use oralization, which you might think of as a very specific form of sonification, so oralization is taking a dry recording, convolving that with an impulse response, and then you should hear that, that performance as if it were in that space. Um, I think from, for me, I struggled a little bit knowing what I know about singers singing in an anechoic chamber. So whenever you record something in an anechoic environment, as Will Kimball was pointing out, and as my singers say to me, that you, as a musician, you are not making the same performance because as a musician, you respond to the acoustic environment in which you are performing, both consciously and unconsciously, in subtle and less subtle ways. So I built a virtual singing studio in the lab, and this allowed me to make dry enough recordings for oralizations, but under performance conditions which more closely uh, mimicked a real performance venue. But I needed to do quite a bit of testing of that first. I, I needed to make sure that my reproduction in the lab was actually realistic and, and was actually a very good reflection of a real acoustic space, and I did that. Um, so in effect, we're sonifying the acoustic properties of, room, of a room and doing that in real time and allowing somebody to interact with that vocally. Okay. Um, there was quite a funny occasion during, during that bit of research where we all listened in the lab to one of the venues that uh, we had recreated and it, it sounded really trebly, and that's the technical term. So there's, there's sort of a high frequency <coughs> ring. We were, I was very worried, spent days, weeks 
um, you know, looking at the code, <laughs> um, checking the signal flow, etc., etc. I couldn't work out where this might be. This artifact might be coming from. <laughs> um, and uh, we just we just had to ignore it and go go with it. A couple of weeks later, we went to the real space. Um, to do some recording. So we realised that the real space was actually quite trendy. <laughs> my, most, my most interesting finding from this bit of work was um, I looked at how singers' intonation um, works in different acoustic environments. Because some singers have said to me, you know, when I, when I sing in this particular venue, nobody can stay in tune. They all go out of tune. Or, you know, they listen to things. And actually I found that people, singers were more in tune when they sang in the virtual uh, reconstruction in the lab than when I took them to a real space <laughs> they suddenly lost the capabilities to, to keep in tune. I, don't, I, I still don't know quite why that is, I have some ideas. Okay. So part of this research really um, then led me to become quite interested in how, so singers respond to, to acoustic spaces, so singers in effect are interacting with the architecture of a space. And we have some useful spaces in York, we really do. But it struck me, and, and you know, this is quite well known, that throughout history, throughout the years, composers have very often composed for a particular space. That led me on to working, starting to work on some more of my more collaborative projects um, around public engagement. So we worked with um, Professor Ambrose Field, who's a composer, um, in the music department at York. And we had also in the lab been doing quite a lot of work on an acoustic space, which is now in ruins at St. Mary's Abbey in, in York City Centre. On the right hand side there, you'll see um, a, a 3D CAD model, um, an acoustic model. So if that was a, a video, you would have to see the sound uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, spreading from, from the centre of the space throughout the building. So we, we had a bit of a crazy idea. How about we take the acoustic model of St. Mary's Abbey, which is now in ruins, um, and, and only some of the stones are, are standing still, and we ask Ambrose to write a piece specifically for that acoustic space that we're going to recreate. That's quite cool. Next challenge. We reproduce that, we perform that in the ruins of the space. That would be constructed, you're still with me? Yeah, I know, it's convoluted, I know. Or <laughs> well, the ruins of the space that we've recreated, which is now in the open air, there's no roof left on that abbey, <laughs> in the open air, in September, in the north of England, um, to as many people as possible who want to come because it's in the middle of a park. Okay. We did that. And we'll play a little bit of, of that amazing piece that Ambrose wrote. But just to say, on the left-hand side there, you'll see a score, and it looks like somebody smudged it. Yeah? It looks like somebody's written it, and then they sort of smudged the ink on some of the, on the notes. So what Ambrose actually did, is he took the acoustic model that, that my colleagues had made of St. Mary's Abbey, and looked at the resonant qualities at various um, frequencies across the spectrum, and looked at how they would relate to different notes. So for each note, he had an understanding of this one will resonate for this length of time, whereas this note will, will fade away more quickly. And it really became part of a compositional toolbox. Whereas perhaps in the past, composers might have been very aware of the acoustics of space for which they were writing, but it wasn't anything that they could work with in a sort of maybe scientifically informed manner. Although we can discuss that in another conference at length. Okay, so this, this, this was the impetus for this. So the motivation here, really, I think, was to engage the public with um, some of the research going on at the university around acoustics, around um, architecture, around archaeology, and, and to make it a widely accessible, free um, public engagement event that uh, as long as it didn't rain, everybody would feel happy to come along to and listen. So there's a picture of, um, I think we had, it was difficult to count because it wasn't ticketed, but around 600 people um, listened to this performance of this, of this brand new piece from this space. 
Just before I play it, and, and I hope we can spend a little bit of time listening to some of it, um, there's a quote from, from Ambrose Field, who I'd like to read. So it says, composers have been writing music for particular spaces for centuries. This practice has largely been informed by oral memory. What if the score could take account of the acoustics of venue? Created by detailed part writing, the singers constantly weave in and out of each other as the piece surges and flows in flurries of activity. It's always moving, but I also wanted to give a sense of being frozen in a moment, which is extended forever. Okay. So I'll play a little bit of that for you now. So we, we built a game and we made an audiovisual piece that could be performed in a variety of venues. Um, so it really was a mix of 3D sound, sonification, composition and chemistry. I worked with Radek Rudnitsky, composer in Jakob Harder, who's a visual artist, and, and I'm indebted to Paul Walton from the chemistry department at the University of York for all the um, chemical uh, knowledge that he uh, shared with us. So again, the, the game was designed to um, widen participation, to widen understanding of some of the research going on at the university and beyond, and should be accessible to, to all people of all ages. Um, the game itself, I mean, it wasn't sonification in the strictest sense of the world, word, but Radek worked with some of the molecular data, much, mostly the positional data, um, on the left-hand side there, you can see um, tamoxifen, which is an anti-cancer drug, is the green um, structure. And then the idea about drug design is you need to design a drug that fits into the site of a target enzyme. And it's a, it's a complex 3D problem. I'll just play you a little bit of some of the sounds that Radek designed. So they were inspired by sonification. Um, but there was more, uh, a more of a curation, somebody um, mentioned this morning, um, a sort of um, a structured design to the sound. So sound design rather than, 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 than simply sonification and some sort of mapping. So the game was you used spatialised sound and when you were uh, far away from the solution, so your, your, your drug was over here and your target enzyme was over here, this is the sound you got. a sort of background hub. Oh, sorry. As you were moving uh, um, closer to the, the target position, um, some harmony arrived. Okay, it's quite faint, it's in the background. But there's a sort of sense of a chord, a settling chord. Okay. Um, the next one's quite interesting. Apparently, if you're doing this with, with this sort of software as a chemist, you, you, you avoid 
um, the, the two structures overlapping because you know that can't happen in the real world because, I don't know, the space-time continuum swaps if, if atoms overlap. So, or something. I'm not a chemist, you can tell. Um, <laughs> so, but we had some really interesting discussions with, with our chemistry people about whether we should sonify the fact that you've overlapped the molecules and you shouldn't have done that. So did you want an alert? Of, beep, 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 you know, something like, ah, don't do this. Uh, and we iterated a few times. And, and Paul Walton was very clear that actually, if we're going to be uh, working in, on a system where chemists and, uh, and, and researchers are using this, we should be taking them out of their comfort zone a little bit as well and allow them to, to do that overlapping of molecules. But we don't want to make them aware. So we ended up with crackles. It's coming in a moment. And then when we were very close to the target, there's a sort of satisfying wobble. This is a technical term. And that slows the closer that we are to the solution. There's much more detail about the actual sonification and some of the mapping in the, in the paper that um, Radhika and I wrote. Um, we also developed a performance. This was an audiovisual performance. It's been performed in a number of places across the world. And this is really key for me, is um, using music, using um, sonification as a, an inspiration, as a trigger point, a starting point for a musical performance really means that we can open things up to new audiences. So this has gone to um, bioinformatic conferences, but it's also gone to uh, Stockholm Technology Festival, Science Squares uh, Festival, and other musical events as well. So it's, it's gone to a few different places. I'm going to have to come out of PowerPoint for one second. I apologize. Um, and just, I'd like to show you a little bit of the Sony Fuels. So the, the, the visuals, are interacting with the sound, they're audio reactive, but also Radek and Jakob um, improvise together around the sound world, around the visual world. Um, so every performance is different. It's not, a, it's not a score that's performed, it's more of a sort of a, an improvisation around the framework. So just give you a taste of this. <laughs> shout at me if I get it all wrong. Um, but I've been involved with um, an ongoing project now for a few years, um, Eon Sounds. So again, it's um, combining sonification, music, performance, data, spatial sound, singing. It, it's got everything. It's just not got the stylophone just yet, has it? <laughs> not quite. But it, but it might do, okay? So Eon Sounds, the aim is really to use um, these stratigraphic timelines that you can see on the left hand side. So these are, are a way of mapping or um, uh, visualizing at least various geological processes. And to use that as an inspiration for musicians and composers and sound artists to try and open up sort of new ways of understanding geological time and in fact examine the relationship between geology and music but also to try and aim for a better understanding of what geologists call deep time. So we're talking on that graph there, um, from top to bottom, it's billions of years. It's not minutes or hours, it's billions of years. And that's something that's quite difficult to sort of get our heads around. Okay. So one of the starting points was how similar this looks to maybe a musical score <laughs> or, or an audio, uh, multiple track audio file. Okay, and that, but that was just 
the starting point. So it's interesting here for me that, again, the impetus came from, from the science, from the geologist, and it's Tim Ivanich, who's now in um, Western Australia. But the, 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 the scientists are sort of coming to us as, as musicians, as, as, as audio engineers, saying, this is interesting, isn't it? We're seeing patterns in our data. Um, what can you do musically? And can we use the patterns that we find as a musical impetus, and then can we build um, um, build a, a, a piece around that, um, again, to engage the public with some of our research. So, apologies for coming out of PowerPoint again, and I had a bit of a PowerPoint issue this morning. I'd just like to play a little bit of one of the pieces that um, James and Ben Ice wrote, and it was the uh, won the award for best use of sound in ICAD 2017. So it may be familiar with you. So it's Fiamin, Nana, Jaw, Gorge, and here we are. <laughs> of the synthesis but it, it extends it builds so much more on that um, as a musical piece and as a means to to inspire and connect an audience um, emotionally to some of the data that we're collecting now about geology and about our environment and about possible uh, changes as we go into the future talking of the future the future is, I think, immersive storytelling. So, you know, there's there's lots for us to do as a communication community, thinking about big data, information overload, AI, robots taking over the world. Um, how can we how can we find a path through this with the use of sound, with the use of in immersive and interactive technologies, in which, of course, you uh, you know, sound plays a very key role in being able to. Um, plausibly uh, recreate a virtual world. If the sound isn't right, um, the virtual world is not going to be effective. Okay. So we're working very much with um, computer scientists and people working in uh, virtual reality and augmented rea reality technology. So um, watch this space for a new projects coming up. So in summary then, I think I've, I've gone quite quickly through a few public engagement um, projects that I've been involved in. And it really, for me, stemmed from a deeper understanding of the human voice through to an appreciation of great architecture and acoustic heritage, architectural heritage. Um, via the challenges of designing anti-cancer drugs, it seems, you know, IRM really, Olaf, pops up everywhere in various places, but that was a real challenge for 3D sound, which you didn't get a, a sense of in this room, but you will if you listen over headphones. Um, and, and moving into now geophysical and geological processes at play over large stretches of time. So, what I think I want to... Um, round off with, because I realise I'm running out of time, is I hope you've recognised some themes coming through this talk. <coughs> so this idea about bridging the gap between art and science, if indeed you believe there is a gap between art and science, okay, maybe there's more of an overlap than some people might um, expect. Um, building on our intuitive understanding of sound, 
understanding that interacting with sound also gives us yet a deeper a level of understanding, enables us to yet deeper understand us, the sound, but also our environment. That engaging and understanding through performance interaction can be really effective. Sonification can be used as an inspiration for musical um, composition and feeds into this idea perhaps that music can also be helped to tell stories and that we have an emotional connection with stories and in fact many people think now is that storytelling is how we understand our world and ourselves and our place in the world. We've got many opportunities as we, as, as, as we go on for enabling, in the world of big data, enabling people to connect and forge an emotional connection with that data uh, and to not be scared by big data and artificial intelligence and all that the future might hold. Um, so I think I'd like to just finish to say, you know, if we, if we work together across our interdisciplinary divides, then we can really use sonification to help us move from mimesis, so that's just purely representing or reflecting the world, through to poesis, so something where we've created something new, some artistic artifact, cultural artifact, an artistic performance, through, I think, and hopefully to kinesis, where actually we're um, connecting with people emotionally and urging them to make some sort of movement, some sort of change. Um, that's going to help us um, face the challenges that are coming around the corner, I think, whether it's environmental concerns, big data concerns, equality, widening participation or activism or political agenda, whatever that is, I think there's a real role for us as sound designers, sonifiers, is that a word? Sonifiers, <laughs> audio engineers, um, and people working in the space. Thank you very much. So, thank you, Julie. <clears throat> no, so, I, wow. So we've got sonification design, social policy, sociology, <laughs> it's just all one thing. Um, I'm, I'm heartened by the fact that what you've done also, I think, is highlight the, the observable fact that sonification, design, and listening is not just a purely cognitive process, and that to understand the sound design and the sonification design better, we need to understand that listening is an embodied experiential process. And, I mean, your anechoic chamber shows that really well. Um, so thank you for that, and I think that's clearly something that should be on our agenda going forward. We, we do have five minutes, <coughs> so we don't have longer, but does anyone have a particular burning issue they'd like to put to Jude or ask Jude? As a ploy, you seem not to have questions. I know. Oh, no, there is one. Okay. <laughs> <It's fine. laughs> In, in multiple projects that you did, um, you combined, uh, strike a nice balance between sound design and, and sonification, um, you know, even though the two are, you know, what, have so much in common. Yeah. So how, how do you find the right balance between, say, musicality, which is more about aesthetics, engagement, entertainment, mm -hmm. um, and information? Because sometimes when we make things too musical, then it gets more difficult to, you know, have that clear communication. But yeah. meanwhile, if it's strictly informative, it might be more difficult to have the average listener. Yeah, sure. I think um, I think there's probably two things there. I think for all the projects that I've been involved with, uh, where sonification has been involved. It's been very much sonification as a springboard to musical creativity. Um, and the aim of the project was to engage the public. So there have been public engagement projects rather than um, helping chemists um, to, to, to make new molecular structures. Um, although there is a role for sonification there as well. So I think it's just a case of um, keeping in mind your, overall, your, your ultimate goal. Um, but, but I think I'm, I'm quite relaxed about um, a musical curation and, and, and bringing musicality and artistic uh, thoughts to bear on 
personification. I'm quite relaxed about that. I'm on the sort of that side of the argument, if there is an argument around that. But you're right. You, um, there's a certain amount of interpretation. There's a certain amount of, of taking data. And there was, there's a picture of somebody uh, doing a rock sculpture this morning. Yeah, it was, uh, Thomas, it was. Yeah. So, so I think whenever we work with data, especially now we work with big data, there's always a certain amount of curation that we have to do. There's a certain amount of first pass of filtering of that data in order to then pull out the, the, the um, aspects, the characteristics that are going to be meaningful. And I, I see musical composition using publication that way as, as just a form of doing that. So it, it's just as valid. But you're right, your question was about balance. And I think the, the balance is just bearing in mind what your ultimate goal is, whether you're designing a sonification system that maybe um, helps with, alongside visualization to really interrogate the deep structure of some data and some fine detail, or whether it's about engaging the public. You know, the public will come to an event that's a, a piece of music. They might not come to me showing them lots of PowerPoint slides of graphs and numbers. Mm -hmm. it's just, Humans, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So, so I think I think that's where where we get the balance. Yeah. Hi, Judy. That was absolutely brilliant talk. Thank you. Um, I have so many questions, but I'll just have to talk to you afterwards. Sure. But I was wondering if you had any, if you'd done in your work any kind of uh, either qualitative or quantitative actual uh, elaboration on the differences between the way the singers sang and sing in the anechoic chamber versus with the in the physical yeah. space and or versus the effects yeah. that generated. Yeah, yeah, I have done that. Um, so not only talking to the singers themselves about what they thought they did differently, but also some quite detailed acoustic analysis of what they produced in the different spaces. But then also asking the listeners to see if listeners could perceive the differences between the different performances as well. Because it might be that, that as acoustic uh, analysts were looking at very specific, oh look, there's a little blip there and that spectrum there, but if, unless it's perceptible, it does, doesn't really mean very much in terms of in a performance context. So yes, I have to measure that. it. Did you have statistics? Yeah, 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 we did all of that. Yeah. Oh, okay question for me. Yeah. Uh, so many th things that stick to me, but one that particularly got me is uh, the term storytelling. Yeah. And actually, uh, we as sonification people would like the data to tell their own story, mm -hmm. but it strikes me that data sometimes just doesn't have the skill of <laughs> storytelling. <laughs> so what makes, what makes this skill, what is this translation that can be brought in to turn the data through uh, the pipe of a very good fairy tale teller. So what, what is, how is the story structured in order to convey as much as possible without being uh, so, let's say, shaped by the designer that the information doesn't get through? So yeah. if you would have any comment yeah. or idea to that. I mean, there's a whole science of storytelling that we, we probably don't need to get into now. But um, I, I, I think it, your question probably relates to, to the first question about the balance between letting the data, just listening to the data, letting the data have its own voice in a way, and then manipulating that to some artistic end. And that might be the, the story that we tell. or We, talk, we, we use the music to enable us to, to tell a story or to engage people in a story. I mean, it doesn't have to be a fairy tale story. It could be, you know, we use story, I think, uh, as, as a very loose term, as something that, that people can, can, can understand and, and sort of grasp and engage with. Um, sorry, what was your question now? About, about whether we want to let, you know, sometimes data isn't that interesting <laughs> or it doesn't have a story to it. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, I've worked with composers and I think composers, um, and musicians are very good at taking an, an external um, idea, something external to them, and, and, and listening to maybe patterns from the data, or maybe it's just actually the data is just noise. That's a story in itself, perhaps. Um, so so that's, that, that's the angle that I'm coming from with, with using sonification as a, as a springboard, I think, uh, for telling, being able to tell a story. Because people engage with signals, they don't engage with graphs. Necessarily. <laughs> one, one last question. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, this is really great. I want to talk to you after. Um, 
Uh, what um, kind of exploration did you do with like having headphones on the singers in the echo chamber and um, moving the spaces around uh, through the headphones? Okay, so um, I haven't had singers in the echo chamber with headphones. Um, what we did, what I did, um, was have singers in the loudspeaker array um, because the singers I was working with. Um, really hated wearing headphones. <laughs> this is a bit of a problem. It's like, I can't sing, you make me wear headphones. Um, I know others, uh, other colleagues of mine now in the, in the lab are working on um, reproducing um, sound worlds in 3D over vinyl technology so that we don't have to get the singers into the, the 50 loudspeaker spherical array. Um, so, but I personally haven't done much work with headphones or not headphones. Um, I just went with not headphones. To, to, to keep the sort of the realism of the of the performance. Okay, we, we really are out of time, but I'd just like to thank you, Jude, for a, a stimulating and thought-provoking talk. Thank, thank you. you very much. Okay.